When we look at many of these megalithic structures that are all over the earth, we really have to wonder, one, how they were built, and more importantly, why they were built. And as we can see here, these you know, monuments are pretty much found all over the world. Um, you know, and one similarity that we see across all of these sites, whether it be in North America, South America, the European continent, China, all over the world, these pyramid structures seem to serve a certain purpose, which is they align to certain star constellations. Now, they don't always happen at the same time across the globe. It's not that simple. But what we do see is a consistency of most of these sites were astronomical outposts. Most of them align to certain star constellations that are going to repeat in a very large cycle of time that lasts 24,000 years. And that's something we'll be discussing here at Ancient School is the precession of the equinox. Pretty much the zodiacal breakdown of the heavens into 12 constellations is for a reason. Think of it as a grand celestial clock. Most of the ancient cultures were aware of this larger cycle of time. And that's why they went to great lengths to create these astronomical outposts and monitor where they were in this larger cycle of time. This will become clearer as you take your lessons at ancient school, but let's look at some of these megalithic monuments specifically. Now, a lot of these sites, aside from their alignments off planet, on planet, the geodetic connections to where they're placed on the globe, again, is of great significance. And most of these sites, when we look up close, reveal the type of architecture we just can't duplicate today. If you look closely here at, Teo, uh, at Tiamanaco, and there's Teotihuacan, and Machu Picchu, and Pumapunku, all of these names kind of sound familiar. There's a region called Lake Titicaca, and it turns out that Tiwanaku and Pumapunku, most of these sites seem to be situated as either harbors at the ancient Lake Titicaca when its water levels were much higher, or were somehow associated with Lake Titicaca to, excuse me, Lake Titicaca to some degree. So a lot of these sites have a similar type of naming structure, but the architecture is of great notice. You can see that a lot of these sites have the stones perfectly connected without the use of mortar. Now, <clears throat> one of the most infamous locations is Pumapunku. Pretty much everything that you would want to see in amazing architecture you find here at Pumapunku in these ruins. Now, this could have been some ancient harbor of Lake Titicaca thousands of years ago, but it's just amazing the type of cuts in the blocks that we see and the ability to stack these so perfectly without the use of mortar there's only one term that really comes to mind to explain this process, and it's called vitrification. As we journey into some of these other images, I'll bring up that term again, vitrification, and we'll kind of dive into its definition. So here at Pumapunku, you can see that, you know, we have these blocks that, again, just defy logic and size. They're, you know, hundreds of tons. These are trilithoton stones. And we know that they were quarried from miles away and then brought to this location and carved into these intricate patterns and stacked perfectly. So we don't know how they transported the stones and we don't know how they formed them into these intricate shapes. We do have a theory which involves that term vitrification, which I'm going to come back to. Now, again, the monuments that we see left here at Pumapunku, it's just kind of a dry desert area. As you can see, there's nothing really out there. There's no existing vegetation. This more than likely was an ancient riverbed or lake bed at one point. Now these stones, anyone, if you were to ask the locals, you know, who, who built Pumapunku, they would simply tell you that this was a place built by the gods. And it, it appears as if the gods, or whoever these beings were, destroyed Pumapunku for some reason, which we still don't understand. They went to great lengths to literally smash it to pieces. Maybe there was some lost technology here that they didn't want us to interpret, or there could have been some ancient battle. But signs seem to point to some type of self-destruction. Now, again, a lot of these stones have a style that is just very hard to understand how it could have been done. And really what's interesting about 
the ability to make these types of shapes and these intricate cuts involves only one process. The ability to take these stones, some of the most hardest on the planet, granite, deerite, and they were able to melt, uh, melt the rock into a molten-like state, kind of like a lava, right? So now it's, it's very pliable. It's almost like putty. Somehow the ancients were able to take advanced shapes and create them, but in a molten-like state. And the reason why we say that is, again, this term, vitrification. Most of these rocks that have been cut like this or have precision-aligned edges seem to show signs of high heat. Uh, it's almost like a glass-like surface, as if you had a tray of lava and you put a, a razor or a sharp edge and scraped over the surface the pattern of how that hardens and reveals the vitrification is the term, is clearly displayed over all of these stones. Somehow, they were able to make these stones into a molten-like state. And then they could press and cut them and create these intricate patterns that there's no other explanation. If we try to explain that they were using diamond-tipped saws, you know, or had some type of advanced computer cutout system, you know, there's, there's, there's no way to explain this other than to say they were able to melt these stones into a lava-like state, and then it would be very easy to cut out these intricate patterns from an existing form, like a clay cut, just perfect thing. And that's exactly what we see in many of these sites, is they've literally pressed out the stone. You can see it was somehow molten, like, you know, melted away. And then what they were able to do is pour hot metal or some other type of metal here to bind the stones together. And again, these types of laser precision holes, this isn't possible with, again, some type of a laser drill, perhaps, or a diamond tip saw using several drill bits. But the precision and accuracy, if we explain this by it was a lava-like state and someone just poked holes perfectly measured, that's a lot easier to, t to create these types of markings and, and drills that we see. <clears throat> now, some of the shapes, again, really just defy explanation. Now, it's possible that someone could have carved these out by hand, but we're talking about stone that's extremely, extremely hard. Granite, deerite, you know, very hard stones. And to see these types of patterns, it makes it, makes it, you know, a lot more able to be uh, palatable and understandable if we think about this becoming more of like a hot lava-like stone and someone just press this pattern into the, into the, you know, lava. And then once it hardens back into a stone, we see these intricate patterns. So I think that's what we're seeing over on many of these sites because we do see this clear evidence of vitrification, what appears to be stone that's been, you know, heavily heated. Now, again, aside from the ability to carve these intricate shapes, another ability which we still haven't been able to come forth with a theory other than magic, you know, or, or anti-gravitic technology that we just don't understand or where, where it went, but they were able to move these megalithic stones over several miles, and somehow they were able to cut them out of the ground, cut them out of these quarry sites and lift them out to be carried away. Now that's something we still don't understand how they could have done this. It, it, it's not possible for us today to even cut out a block this big. You can see a gentleman standing on it. It's not possible for us to today even cut out a block from an existing stone that size and somehow wedge something in there that's gonna lift it out. These are very complex things. You can see that this one was left at the quarry site uh, in Baalbek, and these were stacked several miles away, uh, which, which we'll uh, show you in a minute. But you can see that the immense size of these, they were left because they cracked off, and these were several miles away where, from where they were eventually stacked. And you really have to wonder how they were able to move these types of stones using the advanced, most advanced heavy lift cranes that we have today on Earth. It would be almost literally impossible to move a block of what, what you're seeing here, this size. Now, 
I'm sure it can be done, but you know, it would really be quite a feat and would take some serious artillery uh, tractor beds and such and cranes and coordinating this. Um, but some of the most, you know, recent geologists of today, people who work in stone masonry at, at megalithic sizes like this or in this range, really shake their head and scratch and go, huh, I just don't know how they were doing it and where are their tools that they were using. So it really does raise, you know, a lot of questions. And again, I just uh, want to point out that, you know, these gentlemen you can see standing here give it the proper scale. Uh, some of these, again, weigh in excess of over a thousand tons. You know, we're talking about trilithoton stones when you just had a hundred tons or higher. These are over a thousand tons. So these are extremely large blocks that were somehow moved several miles and then stacked here. You can see another gentleman here as a reference. Now, in Baalbek in Lebanon, there are actually stories that go back thousands of years to biblical times when it speaks of how the gods used these locations like Baalbek as a place to descend from the heavens and also ascend into heaven. And what do they explain is seeing and hearing? Smoke and fire and thunderous sounds. It's almost like an ancient rocket pad. These stones were stacked perfectly. And then over the years, you know, thousands of years later, cultures came and have built other uh, monuments on top of these. But these original stones, no. There's no way that ancient man was able to move blocks like this with some technology that we can't even duplicate today. We're talking about some type of definite intervention, whether it be extraterrestrial intervention or lost knowledge intervention. One thing I'll definitely point out is consistency that in a consistency that I'm seeing is that all of these ancient sites display a type of technology. All of the ancient cultures reference some lost, whether they call them gods or a, an advanced culture that influenced all the great ones that we know of now as the ancient cultures, Egyptians, the Mayans, Toltecs, Aztecs, Sumerian. They all seem to have been influenced by some lost ancient civilization. And I don't think they were completely human, but they definitely lived here on Earth. Right now we call it Atlantis or something. All of this technology seems to be pieces of this lost ancient civilization. And they left these all over the earth. And we're just kind of scratching our head now as to why they built them and what they were for. So Baalbek in Lebanon shows amazing architecture with megalithic stones that really raise a lot of questions. You can see that a lot of these stones up here, I think I can zoom in for you, have what appear to be little holes. Maybe these were some at one point lifted into place and put there. Uh, but these are more a current architecture than, than what we see in some of the more megalithic sites or, or, or stones in this area. But it still should be noteworthy to see that, again, the architecture and use of stone masonry, even from the ancient peoples, was very advanced. <clears throat> now, many of these other sites, like Stonehenge is a, a classic example, really start to raise the bar and not just the type of architecture that we see as far as megalithic stones being arranged in some intelligent way. But now we're seeing a higher level of mathematics and alignments to the summer and some the summer and winter solstices and ways to calculate the motions of the heavens based on the alignments of these stones. So again we still have these anomaly questions as to how were they able to cut the stones of this size? How were they able to move the stones of this size? And now on top of that, why did they arrange the stones in this way? We can only lean upon our current level of science and mathematics that we understand today. What we might know 50 years or 100 years from now might change the way we look at these sites. But right now we recognize that many of these sites are geodetically placed at certain locations. Maybe they were attached to some large energy grid. We'll look at that in another slide in a minute. But looking at Stonehenge specifically, the math and the alignments here, it's not by chance. You can see that the different shadows that are hitting the ground 
allow for markers, kind of like as a calendar throughout the day to mark where shadows fall at certain angles. There's also certain sight stones around the edge that allow you to align various viewpoints from whether you're standing inside or outside the circle. And you can see here that there actually are stones placed outside of the circle for further reference to mark shadows and, and alignments that take place as the summer and winter solstices actually align perfectly to stones and holes cut inside of Stonehenge. Now, this has to have been some type of large ancient clock. And as I mentioned earlier, many of the ancient cultures were aware of a much larger cycle of time and went to great lengths to build monuments that matched these movements of the heavens. Now, what we're seeing here is, again, a classic example of alignments that take place where, based on astronomical movements that, again, repeat over time, in some cases over thousands of years, these alignments continue to take place. It's like a grand celestial clock to understand their purpose or time, where they were in this larger cycle of time. Plato called it the great year. You hear terms like we go into the golden age and then to the dark ages. All of this information seems to be tied to this overall understanding of a larger cycle of time. So we're going to continue to bring that to surface as we go through these topics. Now again, here you can see some of the alignments actually laid out, whether it's going to actual star constellations like Sirius and the Draconis. Uh, we also have the winter and summer solstices. The actual days of the uh, calendar are infused into these rocks in a way where it's marking these alignments that take place throughout time. You can actually see that, you know, the equinox is perfectly aligned with being able to look at true north and south and understand that the alignments of Stonehenge are happening, happening on our planet perfectly with true north and south, but as well as off planet to actual different star constellations and using all of this information as some large celestial clock. Now, we see that many of the sites around the world, you know, Stonehenge and, and, and Teotihuacan, even the Great Pyramid, uh, Baalbek, they're all appearing on these lines, whether they be called ley lines or just geodetically coded locations. It's maybe possibly some ancient energy grid. Now, we know that there was, through Nikola Tesla's work and others, very easy to harness natural energy. And it appears these megalithic sites are built at certain latitude and longitudes that are possibly tapping into this ancient energy that just exists, whether it be through hyperdimensional physics, as some of the researchers like to call it. All of the planets and their spin are creating a vortex of energy that I think the ancients and possibly even extraterrestrials were aware of, are aware of, and use this knowledge. And that's why a lot of these sites are so fascinating, is because they contain so much information that we still have yet to understand. Now, the Great Pyramid of Giza is one of the most excellent megalithic monuments that we can continue to refer to because not only is it built, again, perfect true north-south, it's, it's situated right in the middle of all of the world's landmass. And it's aligned in ways that we just can't understand with its ability to align to the constellation of Orion in 10,500 BC. The building style of the bricks, the inner chambers of the king and queen's chamber. I mean, the king's chamber, if it, if it was built for a king, why are there no hieroglyphics in the king's chamber? Why are there nothing inscribed on the walls uh, giving the, you know, the, the great fervor of the king? What we see is an empty box, actually a box that's the exact same dimensions for the Ark of the Covenant. And all throughout Egypt, there are these depictions of what, I, what appear to be a form of an ark, you know, a, a, some large box with two poles on each side, just like you saw in the Indiana Jones movie, uh, The Raiders of the Lost Ark. That ark, that depiction, is seen all throughout Egypt. It's very possible that there's a whole other story, which hopefully we'll talk about in future lessons, that Moses was actually 
a pharaoh of Egypt named Akhenaten. And when he left Egypt and took his people, he also took the Ark, this great power source. Again, remember the movie Raider the, Raiders of the Lost Ark? It, it's killing all the Nazis with lightning bolts. They, they see spirits coming out of it. Well, there's a lot of information that shows to exist in saying that the pyramids were possibly large energy capacitors of some kind or were utilizing the Ark of the Covenant as an example, as a large energy capacitor, possibly tapping or sharing in, you know, in this energy that was ubiquitous around the globe. We seem to have lost that knowledge. But the alignment still exists. The math still exists. We can look at these objects and now, just based on satellite telemetry, can do basic, basic mathematics and look at the repeating algorithms and things that we see that aren't just by chance. There's no way that people could have just built the pyramids stone by stone, let alone the time and effort to do it, but the planning of the architecture is too perfect. These alignments, again, can be confirmed by using computer mapping software, and you can easily see when the stars are going to appear above you at night, right? So when we use Redshift or any of these programs that you can easily download for your iPad, where do I see the stars at night? You can roll that clock, clock forward and where they're going to be ahead of you in a week, or roll that clock backward. And in 10,500 BC, the Orion constellation is a perfect match with the pyramids on the ground. The pyramids are literally forming a terrestrial map of the sky. So we, we have to wonder why many of these sites are built to align to a star constellation. And obviously the kicker of why this alignment is so interesting is, you know, the pyramids were supposedly built by the Egyptians. You know, early dynasties were looking at 2500 BC. That's about 4,000, 4,500 years ago, right? Because, you know, we're 2014. So if you go to uh, AD, BC, 2,000 years ago, that's zero. <laughs> and then if you go back another 2,500 years, right, you're then at 2,500 BC, but that's 4,000 years. So whether or not the Egyptian culture is only 4,000 years, 2,500 BC, I don't think so. Why is it that this, these pyramids align to Orion in 10,500 BC, 8,000 years earlier? And there are wall reliefs in Dendera, Egypt. You can just Google Dendera, Dendera wall reliefs. And, and basically, you will see that the Dendera wall relief of the great view of our zodiacal uh, uh, solar system, our view of the heavens, Essentially, they have a view of the heavens with all of the star constellations that would have been in view from the ground at around 8,000 years ago or 8,000 BC. I'd have to actually check that. I believe it's 8,000 BC. Why would they want to mark the view of the heavens from the ground at what it looked like in 8,000 BC? Either they were there or something amazing happened at that time. And they're trying to remember that by marking it with these amazing alignments. So again, the math at some of these sites, we really have to scratch our heads and wonder. And it's not just Egypt. These pyramids exist all over the earth. Um, obviously, when we go into South America, that's really the next big uh, shell of information where we see advanced systems of worship that took place based on astronomical movements, knowing when there'd be a solar or lunar eclipse, just like you saw in Mel Gibson's movie, Apocalypto, and the priest looked over at the king and said, do your thing, because he knew when the solar eclipse was going to take place. Many of these ancient sites, again, are aligned and show repeating alignments within the, the architecture. In you know, South America, <clears throat> many of these sites really raise a lot of questions, not only because of why they were built, but what they actually signify. And all throughout you know, South America, there, there are these talks of these ancient gods. What's really interesting about the whole, you know, Mayan civilization and the return of Kuku Khan or, you know, this ancient god is they have a very advanced calendar system. And these monuments, again, are markers in that calendar system. And so we have to wonder if they're not trying to tell us information to say when these ancient gods will return 
or at least when the ancient gods were last here, or when they were here and something momentous took place, and they've created these alignments to mark those times. Now, when we look again at the architecture at some of these sites, uh, this one again is amazing. And some of these pyramids, you know, uh, you know, the great tomb of Palenque, um, you know, uh, King Pakal, I should say, his his pyramid, he literally is his tomb is inside of a pyramid. And when we look at some of the architecture around how they were able to build this pyramid around his tomb, it really raises a lot of questions, let alone this infamous tab uh, or large tablet, I should say, that covers the tomb of Bacall and literally looks like King Bacall is flying a rocket ship. You can just Google King Bacall. These are things that I'll show in future lessons. Now, this pyramid uh, specifically that we're going to look at here really has an interesting play uh, that happens based on, again, an astronomical alignment, a play on light and shadow. And you can see that it's a, a very well-traveled tourist spot. And at several of these locations nearby, again, we see astronomical observatories, literally built out of stone as ways to go up here and have a clear view to make astronomical observations. And this was done by high priests and astronomers and recorded as sacred information. Now, what we see here is a very interesting light and shadow effect of the serpent god being memorialized by this simple shadow. The sun, literally at a certain time of the year, will hit this part of the pyramid and create this shadow effect. And you can see the serpent's mouth here. And it's literally like a snake, the serpent god coming down from, from the heavens. And this is memorialized, and people make great reverence to see this shadow effect and appear from all around the world. So you have to wonder how momentous this must have been even for ancient people, because even today we're in revered and awe as to how this is possible and why the ancient people memorialized their interaction with their gods. And in this case, the serpent god, whether it be Kukul Khan or, uh, you know, Quetzalcoatl, there's many variations of these Hispanic gods, but they have a similar theme of being serpent gods. Also, interestingly enough, when we look at some of these gods, you know, they're usually pale skin in either white hair or red hair. White, pale skin, red hair, and they're gods of the South American people who are all dark skin, dark hair. It's very interesting information. And they went to great lengths to memorialize these interactions with their living gods. Now, again, when we look at many of these sites, uh, the Pyramid of the Sun, the Pyramid of the Moon, all of these sites across uh, South America really raise, again, a lot of a question, a lot of questions based on their not only size, but placement. And Eric von Däniken actually theorized that the placement of all of these pyramids align with various planets that we know of in the solar system, as if they were marking on Earth the various planets known about in our solar system. But the math can't be denied. Again, we see these repeating mathematical patterns that are just too consistent for an ancient civilization to have done by chance. You know, there was great architectural planning done into building these monuments. And as you can see, we're talking about a very grand scale. Anytime I look at this site, I always think that, boy, what if large spaceships or rocket ships were landing here or were parked here <laughs> and used by the gods. I mean, this is literally the place of where man interacted with the gods. Why wouldn't there also be vehicles of the gods, chariots and such that we've seen depicted in ancient times? They had no other way to understand a conveyance of flight than to put wings on it or give it a fiery uh, chariot in the sky. But we have a lot of depictions and sounds of the, of, the, of the presence of these ascensions and descensions of spaceships of the gods. It's always loud, thunderous smoke and fire, just like a rocket ship. So these, to me, very much have a similarity to what I would say could be some type of ancient landing and launching pad. Otherwise, again, for ceremonial purposes, I can see that as well. But 
we have to wonder if the names being all around planets and a place where the humans met the gods, if inter interesting things were taking place that weren't just mythology. Um, so again, these step pyramids is that they're kind of you know making their way up to heaven. It's a repeating theme that we see throughout South America. Now Machu Picchu again, uh, looking at some other ancient, some of these other ancient sites again, we see mathematical almost perfection in the cut and layout of these of these uh, locations. And thankfully, through the use of satellite imagery, not only can we be on location and do measurements, but we can also do these types of satellite measurements. And again, the alignments and things that we're finding really raise a lot of questions. I even have to give my hats off to NASA, who's been using a new type of synthetic aperture radar, and they've essentially equipped a, a large 747 with this synthetic aperture radar, and they can fly over lake, lo locations like this, and they use this ground, ground penetrating radar, synthetic aperture radar, where it can literally pierce through the layers of ground and give you views of what you're seeing in the strata. And there have been several locations where we've now discovered through this synthetic aperture radar what appear to be shrubs and bushes, pyramids, and ancient cities that are hidden from view. We're now discovering through satellite telemetry and the use of new radar technologies. So again, whether we look at Machu Picchu from satellite or we look at it actually physically at location, we see a type of brilliance being displayed that, again, you have to wonder why were they cho why did they choose to live so high in the mountains and how is it they had such amazing architectural knowledge to build such feats as we see at Machu Picchu. And as we dive in closer, we see that they had a, an ability to use stones without any masonry and create these layouts that you can only imagine a thriving civilization. I mean, it already looks very inviting in its, in its ruined state, but with, you know, beautiful tapestries and, and festivities and fruit and commerce going on, these were some pretty amazing cities. And we have to wonder where, where they all went. Um, now, this is Lama has a nice view. Again, the, the architecture and brilliance that we see displayed at some of these sites like Machu Picchu, when we get in closer and look at some of the actual architecture, we see a type of mortarless building style that, again, is very similar to what we see in Egypt, very similar to what we see across South America. This is some type of way that they were able to heat the stone into this molten-like state. And then it was very easy to stack them and push them together so that there's literally not even the ability to put a piece of paper through some of these cracks. Literally, just mortarless building uh, that will withstand, as we've seen now, thousands of years. So the only explanation for this type of style of building was heating these stones to a, to a state of almost like lava. This one's a great example. There's no way they'd be able to do these types of intricate cuts and have everything fit perfectly, even literally creating an open area to view, view like, a, like a window, if you will. But these stones don't make any sense to have been cut like this with ancient tools. The only way we can explain it is we see clear signs of heat. And if you were to actually look closer, I don't think I can do any better than to zoom in here, but it almost looks like as if once they were stacked, there were scrapes done, like literally just scrapes where they were able to just cut these perfect incisions into the rock after they were laid in place. So it really does raise a lot of questions as to how they were able to heat stone to a degree where it was like in a molten-like state and they could just fit them together like these blocks that you see here. And some of these, again, are almost cut out like a cement press perfect in size, over and over, just kind of coming out of like a, a cement truck, if you will, uh, and, and then always stacked perfectly without, without any mortar. So we have to wonder how they were able to do this, and more specifically, why? Why did they go, why did they go to such great lengths to build these intricate structures that, again, have these alignments 
or in very interesting geodetic locations around the globe. Well, we seem to see a representation at many of these sites that speak of for the gods, built by the gods, uh, a place where we interacted with the gods, a place where the gods descended or ascended from heaven, and this connection with megalithic stones. In my mind, there must be you know, some coincidence that's grander than just that. There's knowledge of some lost ancient culture, civilization, whether they were gods or aliens, or both, maybe not gods and aliens, maybe whether they were human or alien, I think what we're looking at is depictions of lost knowledge. All of these ancient cultures attributed to these types of gods. But I think it could have also have been an advanced lost civilization, an Atlantean civilization. I don't want to generalize it that easily. But some great lost civilization that influenced every culture around the world and left us these monuments to wonder how is it that the ancient Aztecs or the Mayans or the Egyptians built these? Maybe they didn't. We see a type of being being depicted all around the globe at these sites. And in the next lesson, we're going to dive into this further in ancient gods. But all around the world, there's this depiction of a slender being and their hands are always wrapped at the waist. Whether it's in Turkey or in Gobekli Tepe or in Rapa Nui or even throughout South America, there's this similar depiction of this being. Maybe these were the beings influencing all the ancient cultures that we now have today. Egyptian, Mayan, Aztec, Toltec, all these ancient ones. <clears throat> they went to great lengths to carve little faces and various things, either in dedication towards a god or in at least acknowledgement that there were places where gods and man interacted. And again, they always went to great lengths to build architectural monuments at these sites. Geodetic locations part of some large energy grid, or just a coincidence that they were having interaction with their gods at these various locations. Now, some of the sites are actually underwater. Now, this is Yanaguni, and we still put into question some of these sites like Yanaguni off the coast of Japan. Uh, but clearly, if anyone actually goes to these sites, or if you look at satellite imagery of these locations, what we're seeing appears to be non-natural, very much like step pyramids and things that we see above the water. So it's very possible that there were ancient cultures that existed 10,000 BC to 50,000 BC, many, many years before we currently look at ancient cultures now, at you know ancient Sumer at 3,800 BC. Obviously, there's evidence of ancient cultures going much further back but we haven't uncovered a complete civilization yet. Only signs, only pieces of evidence to say that, yes, there are ancient cultures that existed on monuments above the earth, uh, above ground, as well as even underwater. So further studies obviously need to be done at Yanaguni. And I'm sure that over time, <clears throat> more of these sites will be found by the use of satellite telemetry and soon to be new radar technologies that allow us to image the surface of, you know, the oceans as well, where I'm sure there's a plethora of lost monuments and technology. So one of the sites that, again, has come into focus is Gobekli Tepe. Uh, it's a site in Turkey, the, uh, Turkey with uh, large megalithic stones with intricate animals. And again, this being is shown in Gobekli Tepe. It's, uh, sorry, I don't have a picture of his face. Uh, we'll go to the next slide here in a minute. But you can see that Hands always, again, wrapped at the waist, these slender beings. They're shown at all of these megalithic locations. I wonder if it isn't some type of lost civilization. Uh, here, again, you can see Gobekli Tepe, various pillars. They literally, this was buried in the sands of time. And someone just happened to see a little stone sticking out on their property and started to uncover it. <clears throat> and it turns out to be this very intricate astronomical marking system with little animals and, again, these beings, hands wrapped at the waist. So we still don't understand what this site meant, but, again, it seems to be tied into this larger evidence of a great civilization that influenced everybody. Here's another pillar that we can see with some type of an animal at Gobekli Tepe. Now, another area, again, where we see these beings, hands wrapped at the waist, is 
in one of the most remote areas on Earth, if not the most remote, Easter Island, Rapa Nui, we have what are known as the Moai, whether they be in these statue form or in these heads, what we thought were heads. It turns out that the Moai heads are not just heads, they're full bodies. And again, hands are always wrapped at the waist. These are some ancient depicted being, but for some reason has been buried underground for probably thousands of years and only the heads have been above the surface. We really have to wonder what this means. We're trying to look at some of the you know depictions and things that we're finding at these locations now and kind of match them up. But it really raises a lot of questions looking at these Moai head and realizing now that they too are this representation of a slender being, hands wrapped at the waist. So we're definitely going to continue to look at these megalithic sites and explore why these alignments take place and hopefully find some of the you know hieroglyphic and, and writings and things that are consistent around the globe telling us this story of this lost ancient culture. Okay, I think that's going to probably wrap up our lesson for today.